Birch. I'm an engineer at RevSys. Uh, and I'm Jacob Kaplan-Boss. Uh, I'm the director of security at Heroku and uh, in charge of coffee at RevSys. So we're going to uh, talk to you today about working parts out of Django and being happy about it most of the time. Uh, so let's start on an agreeable note. Uh, everyone in this room, maybe. Well, he fiddles. Uh, I'll, I'll spoiler. Django is awesome. That's what the next slide's going to say. And it's so awesome that 200 people took planes, trains, taxis, cars, buses, uh, bicycles, I think, to get here on an island in the French Riviera so we can all have a copy and talk about how awesome it is. Uh, Django, one of the reasons that makes Django so awesome is it comes with basically everything, basically every site would need, certainly to get started, and most of the time it doesn't go. However, because it's sort of a not minimalist framework per se, but it can't have everything. Uh, and this is actually not a bad thing, that it doesn't have everything you would ever need in a web framework. It's a feature. I love it because it allows me to do uh, one of the best American pastimes, shopping. When you need to get something in your site uh, that Django doesn't provide, it'll let you look through so many blog posts, get up repos, define the thing people have already done to do what you need to do. So let's go over a uh, sort of a, a day in the life of day uh, in a typical Django application. You start with a Django site. You have a template engine, you have the model layer, uh, you have all the stuff in between, uh, and you're really happy about it. And then you hire a designer. Uh, he or she prefers Jinja. Once you switch Jinja, great, let's swap it out. Let's take the Django template engine out, and let's add Jinja. And next you're noticing, hey, we have a lot of small data that's not really relational. We want to serve it really fast. Cool. There's Python and apps for us. Uh, so let's use, oh, sorry about that. Uh, before that, you want to write a sweet API. <laughs> um, so you rip out all the views, use Tastify, use Django REST framework, uh, and you get that going. And then you start using a lot of Redis, you decide all that relational data that you were using, that's not important to business anymore. You rip out model, and that's kind of fun. Uh, and then you're using some uh, whiz, uh, wizardy because you don't, you don't need uh, what Django's doing anymore. You start doing JavaScript stuff, you start doing other things, uh, and other things. So the question really comes in, you know, once your site has been around for a while, is this batteries included approach really something that's helped you very much, right? You know, Django comes with all of this stuff, but when you work on a typical site, by the time it's been around for six months, a year, two years, three years, you probably find that you've taken a lot of what Django, you know, originally came with, and you've started replacing it for various reasons. So this whole batteries included thing, you know, it, it cuts both ways. It gets you started quickly, but people often can feel, you know, uh, hemmed in by, by the batteries. They, they, they want to use a, a non-relational data store, but Django doesn't support it, so what do you do? They want to use a different template language, but Django doesn't ship with one, so what do you do? So this, this pattern of moving what comes with Django is something that most people who have been using Django for a, a while end up experiencing in, in, in some sense. I, I'd be willing to bet if we had talked to every one of you here, Every single person who has a Django site would have, at some point, taken a thing that came with Django and kicked it to the curb in exchange for something else. So that's basically the thrust of this talk. We want to talk about what happens when you decide to rip things out of Django. What happens when what comes with Django isn't enough? What happens when it's time to get rid of Django inside of your Django site? So we're going to kind of move from easy to hard. We're going to start with placing templates. We're going to talk about placing sort of views. We're going to talk about what happens when you need a different authorization framework. And finally, we're going to talk about models. And maybe then at the end, we'll talk about what, what else is left by the time you've ripped off, you've ripped out these large, um, these large parts <coughs> of Django. And, uh, hopefully, we'll see kind of some themes as we go and get an idea of where, where Django does gracefully fade into the background and let you replace pieces with whatever you want to use, and then also where Django stubbornly insists on having its own way and doesn't let you customize it. <laughs> on the opposite of the spectrum settings uh, are templates. 
is actually going to do these stubborn ways uh, to replace the code. And it's one of the way, um, aspects of Django that people look to replace um, first. And it's just because the Django template engine is it's a different style that some people may not be used to, and they want to use something else. Maybe they've heard about the speed upgrade you can get uh, using the, a different template engine. Or uh, they just want a more expressive uh, syntax, something that looks a little bit more like Python and a little bit less like something else in some form. Um, one of the libraries that a lot of people look to in place is Django 2. It's sort of Django template engine plus plus. Uh, it looks, we'll look at a uh, Django template uh, in a little bit, but it looks a lot like a uh, Django template. Uh, but you get a more expressive uh, syntax. You can do a lot of things that look more like Python and uh, less like sort of a weird conglomeration. Uh, you get your templates compiled with bytecode uh, as opposed to sort of reprocessed every time a uh, template is rendered. Uh, and you get a lot of like really neat extendable, uh, extendable things like uh, macros uh, and things of that nature. So let's go. One thing to point out here is that that link at the top, um, uh, uh, Armin, who is the author of Jinja, uh, he had a summer code project where he tried to replace the internals of Django's template language with the internals of Jinja, and essentially that doesn't work so well because of some pretty horrible nastiness with the Django template language. He wrote a really interesting postmortem on the project, and so Birch is listening, is linking to there, and that, that gives you really interesting comparison between the internals of Django and the internals of Jinja, and, and it'll help explain um, like why Jinja is Although it looks the same on the surface, it's kind of fundamentally different from Django in different ways. And it's also, um, it's like a three years old, I think, at this point, but it's still really relevant. It's a really long, interesting read if you've ever been history in the world. Interested about what's going on behind the scenes uh, with both uh, template things. So here's a Jinja template. It should look really familiar except that one line. I have written this line. I think most of you have written this line. You've got in this, you remind yourself, right, dot notation. Even if it's a mapper, even if it's a dictionary, use dot notation. Uh, probably the least of that one of Jinja's features, but still a feature is you can use this. This is valid Jinja. Um, so I wrote this, I wrote this template and copied and pasted the error when I rendered it using um, the short of its render. And then I wrote this. It's 10 lines. Uh, it is a drop in replacement for render. It works exactly like it, and it just works, quote unquote. Uh, one thing, the interesting thing to note and remember is that while we think request con, we feel like request context should be a dictionary, uh, it has a lot of mapper properties. It has has key, it has update, it has get. Uh, it actually isn't. It's actually a thin wrapper around an iterable uh, or a list of dictionaries. So you need to go through each one, throw it into a dictionary, and then pass that to Jinja, because Jinja expects one dictionary object. And it's actually one of the core differences behind the, how the two template engines work. If that's too, if that's too much code for you, there's a library called Jinja. This is what Mozilla Web Dev uses uh, for their Jinja. The Jinja, a lot of, a lot of similar syllables, syllables I'm dealing with. Uh, and it's what they use. It's a drop-in app. You install it, you change a few settings, and then all of a sudden, render works, render the screen works, Anywhere where Django was using Django templates before, it just works. There's also a setting that lets you override um, if you have an app that you want to use the Django template engine. Uh, Admin is a really good example. Uh, important thing to note if you're using Django compressor, that is does have a tight coupling with the Django template engine, but there's a project to get past that and you can still keep using Django. So I'm curious, Django, where would you choose to switch from Django to Jinja? What's sort of your, why would you make that decision, if, if at all? So I talk, uh, I, I haven't done it, uh, but I talked to both Mozilla and Pitchfork.com, uh, who are using both Django and Jinja together. And it seemed like the number one thing that was coming up was they had very complicated, CPU-heavy uh, templates. They were doing a lot of extending, um, and they noticed uh, in their own benchmarking that it, a significant increase in speed when the templates became compiled. Uh, but then what they got with it, and sort of, they came for the speed, but they stuck for the macros. They stuck for these, this really, uh, I don't want to say beautiful, but it's extremely extendable, and you can kind of do things with it, and it fits 
Python programmers mind more. Um, and they just kind of enjoyed sticking with it. There was some voice of the dissent. There was very few people, I didn't talk to them, and it wasn't like, we were so happy we switched to Django. Uh, they, they were happy with it, they didn't regret it. Some people were, would have preferred they had stayed just to keep using any third party apps that came along. Uh, but for the most part, it seemed like it was speed extendability. I think a good thing to point out there is, uh, you often hear about um, you know, Django templates are slow. Uh, what's really interesting about both those examples is they actually benchmarked and proved, and proved it. I, I've seen plenty of sites where the bottleneck is not the template language, and so the, the time spent to replace it is essentially like a waste of time in rewriting all these templates. So I think what's really interesting about both those use cases is they actually they took the time to figure out whether this was actually something that was affecting them and you know, made a choice basically based on data. That's actually a really interesting point. Something I wanted to point out and forgot to on not just templates, but everything we talk about. Um, Alex Gaynor is not here, so we're all adults here. Uh, we know. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, Alex. He's <laughs> <laughs> it's it's actually growing up. It's sad. I can't make jokes like that. Uh, but we trust you. We trust you. Like, just because we're showing you you can do it, you can replace the fence, doesn't mean you should. Uh, please, just as my general rule, number one rule of architecture is plan ahead. Know why you're doing this. Have data that says, this is why we need to do this. Don't just do it because it's flashy or you heard from someone that changes faster, so we're changing. Um, and in most cases, it's not going to be your bottleneck. It's not going to be that big of an increase until you prove that it is. And then go for it and use some of our advice here. All right, so moving on to views. So this is a bit of a misnomer. You can't really replace views in Django. You can't really just not use Django views because of the fact, because of the way that views are tightly coupled to the routing way. A view really is not a view is really not a thing. There's no you know there's no view class. There's no you know view thing. It's basically just a contract that the router enforces. Um, and so you can't really say oh you can get rid of views, um, but without without getting rid of the router. But that view contract, the the um, the pattern that's enforced by the router, is so simple and so basic that you can, with, within the confines of this very simple contract, you can do anything you want. And so, let's review that contract really briefly. Um, so, the contract that the router makes is that a view has to be a callable, we'll talk about what, exactly what we mean by a callable in a bit, that takes a request and returns a response. It's a very, very simple contract, right? The, the URL router is gonna pass in a request object, you do whatever you want, as long as what comes out at the end is a response object. Um, and in particular, the request object you get is this django.httpa.htp request object, and what you get back is an HTTP response object. Um, what you pass back is a response object, or, or a subclass. So this is such a simple contract that within those confines, you can do just about anything you want. Um, so let's start by taking a look at a typical view. This is like a very classic, um, uh, you know, I've got a database of people and show me all the living people. Um, and you know, this is this is classic in that it kind of uses in these few lines of code, we're using like the whole enchilada. We're using we're using views, we're using models, I've got this, this person model, we're using um, uh, we're using Django's template layer, we're using request response, we're using like the whole entire you know Django burrito just in a couple of lines of code. Um, so it's easy to kind of look at this and think, oh, views are like really tightly coupled to templates and to models. And, and you know, we classically, we sort of think of them as being that way, right? This is a very typical pattern, right? Read from the database, render a template, return the response. We sort of think of this as being a, a, a pretty tight coupling between um, models and templates and views. Um, but let's, let's dig in a little bit and, and, and examine whether that, that coupling is really there. So, First, we have to kind of look at what render actually does. So if you go look at the source code for uh, django.shortcuts.render, what render is really doing is actually very simple. Um, it's calling template.loader.getTemplate, which is a lookup function that finds a template on a disk. This returns a template object. It's constructing a context from the dictionary that you pass in. Then it's rendering the template using that context and returning an HTTP response. That's it, right? 
render itself replaces you know three lines of code. It's not a very it's not a very uh, uh, it's not shortcutting a lot. It's just sort of a, a, a nice simple convenience for a common pattern. But once we unpack and expand what render does, we start to see that this coupling that we think about between views and models and templates is really actually only a convention, right? The only reason that we're coupled to Django.template is because we load a Django template in the view. And the only reason we're coupled to um, the model layer is because we're using a model in the view. So it's very easy then to remove the model layer just by not using it. <coughs> hey, look, I removed the ORM from Django. So in this example, I'm using Redis rather than um, rather than Django's models, right? And it's basically the same, you know, the same idea as this, right? Where instead of saying, you know, cursor.objects.filter, I hit up a Redis database, right? It's a, it's the pattern is the same. We're still doing the same thing conceptually, right? The view is reading some data from a data store, rendering a template, returning a response, but now I replace that read from a data store with a different the different function. And this is still a view, right? There's nothing about this that makes this less, less view -y. And so similarly, I can very easily get rid of template. So what, what if, instead of rendering a template, I just want to return some JSON data? Super simple. Python's got built a JSON library, use json.dumps, return a response with the J a JSON content type, and look, I've replaced the template engine now, too. Right? So with just a couple of simple modifications, I just went and got rid of this supposed coupling, right? The only the only way in which that the only way in which views are actually coupled is in terms of this convention. So we talked about callables. So let's let, let's talk about what callable means for a minute in Python. Normally we think of callables as being functions, and that's normally the case. But actually, when you when you call something in Python, you use the parentheses. What what it's actually doing, like a lot of other things in Python, is it's hitting this double underscore call method, and it's and anything that has a call method is callable and can be called. Um, and this very simple realization about what callables are is what leads to all the sort of class based everything that exist in. Uh, in Django, Django's built-in class-based views, as well as third-party things like this, which is an example of Django REST framework. Um, so here is a REST API built using Django REST framework, and Redis is the data store. And as you can see, there's basically no Django left here. Right? The only Django part is uh, settings. <sighs> but other than settings, this is, this is actually this doesn't look anything like Django. This is like just totally other code, but because we built on this building blocks of these very simple uh, router um, contract, we can very easily replace our views with something like this. And in fact, we have a couple of really good choices for doing REST APIs in in uh, in Django, Django REST framework, and TastyPy. And there's a very the reason that these the reason that we're we're talking about these things as a sort of view replacement because there's a really common pattern where you replace Django views and Django templates with a REST API, something like Django REST Framework or TastyPy, and a front end library like Ember or Angular or Backbone or et cetera, et cetera, and React is another really good one. Um, and this works really well together. Django and Django REST Framework and TastyPy are reasonably agnostic about what's running on the front end. And Angular, Ember, et cetera, are fairly agnostic about running on the back end. And so typically what ends up happening is you have to write like 10 to 20 lines of code, either in Python or in JavaScript, to sort of knit the two together, to, to make sure that the shape of the data that's returned by your REST framework matches the shape of the data that's expected by your client library. And suddenly you've got a really nice story for doing rich front ends. Uh, this link here has an example of REST framework and Angular to do a rich front end with Django. But the technique applies to, you know, TastyPy and Ember, REST framework and Backbone, you know, hand-rolled JSON views and React.js, like the pattern, this pattern of eliminating, replacing views with a REST API and eliminating templates entirely to re replace by a rich front end framework is really powerful and leads to a lot of, um, a lot of really good, a lot of goodness. It's a very nice, 
So, Jacob. <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. <laughs> so, a, a pattern I hope you're noticing as we were kind of the halfway point is things that feel like they are stubbornly tightly coupled, or at least somewhat coupled, when you look at each of those little parts actually the mark. And that may be no more true than a, an off. Uh, trips and quotes here because when you start to do a Django application, uh, all of these things are installed uh, by default. You get all of these from the get go. They aren't things you optionally add later that Django happens to come with. And there's a good reason for that. Uh, most people need off, and we want to make sure users are using off that is actually secure. Um, all the eyes have been dotted, and the Django off framework does a really good, or Django off backend does a really good job of doing that. But when you look through each of these parts, you have a middleware. All that does is look at a session data and assign request.user uh, using session middleware. You have a model backend. All that does is sort of authenticate that a user is a user, and uh, it makes it able to look up a user. Uh, you have a base model, which is a username, email, a few other unfortunate fields by default. Uh, which, but it's now extendable, and we'll get to that uh, in, in a bit. Uh, and then we have a context processor that adds literally two variables to a template, user and perms or permissions. Um, and when we need to do something outside of this, something in addition to this, maybe you want to log in with Twitter, or you want to do a single, um, a cross-site cross single sign-on. Uh, what you actually end up usually doing is taking these parts out but replacing them with things that look really similar. Uh, so this, if you need to do something like this, first place I would start is the contrib off code and look what there are, uh, Django's already doing. It'll get you a really good place on where to start. Because um, all it ends up doing is off, all it does is make sure, hopefully securely, the user is who they say they are and assigns the request.user object. That's basically all it does. And then it's just these individual parts that help you get along that journey. So I was trying to think of an example to show replacing all, the, all of that uh, and extending the, uh, the off um, backend. And I discovered most of the code I was writing was really boilerplate code for the security part. The security is hard, it's complicated. We have to make sure that nothing nefarious has happened. Uh, so if I was trying to use Twitter or GitHub, it, most of the code was just unrelevant and it was really hard to follow. Luckily for me, doing things insecurely, extremely insecurely, was really easy. So my example is really bad. Please do not do this. If you are copying and pasting code from slides or doing it wrong, uh, so don't do this. Please, please don't do it. So I've labeled it as best as I can to make it clear you're not doing this. And once you see what the example is, yeah. you won't want to do this. <laughs> so I needed a way that stored plain text passwords. It wasn't the ORM because I needed a non-session, uh, or non-ORM backed, uh, non-model layer backed um, authentication system. This is where GitHub comes in. Uh, yeah, it's coming through pretty good. Uh, these are just, uh, the description of the gist is a username. Each has a file, password.txt, with a password in it. Uh, and this is how we're going to make sure that you are who you say they are. And, and Jacob, just to clarify, are these, are these private or public gists? Well, Frank's is private. However, the rest of them are public. Uh, so <laughs> if you ever wanted to be me, uh, Jacob or a Jacob, uh, just hit, hit this user and you'll find out how to. So the first thing we're going to replace is the back. Um, an off backend uh, needs to define two fields. Get user, which provides a user ID and return a user. Usually you don't need to change that too much. If you extended the user model, you might want to use um, explicitly your own model. But other than that, it's not important. The important part is uh, the authenticate method. Uh, as you see, uh, we do a request method. Get me some gifs from this user. Uh, that code's not that important. Um, is there a user with this name? Cool. Is there a really secure password that takes file the same thing as uh, a form passed in? It is? Great. Let's log in. Uh, let's, that's the user. That's who we want to be. Uh, this code is all available up here. All the code on often templates is available on uh, this repo. Uh, the other thing we need to do is we need to extend the user uh, model. I'm not going to go too much into that. Uh, outside the scope of this talk, but uh, there's a resource available in the docs for it. But we need to sort of just ID, because if we make any changes to our really secure password, we want to pass it along. Uh, and then we just need to add a couple of settings to uh, get, everything, <laughs> get everything linked together. Uh, and this uh, works, uh, and sort of sadly so. 
So we've gotten rid of the back end user, and that leaves the two other pieces. Um, the context processor, you probably don't need the change. Um, maybe you want additional user data, you just write your own context processor. That's, that's not that hard to figure out. Um, but the middleware is a little more interesting. It's usually a thing you don't need to do, because the middleware is what looks at session data, and you probably want to use a, um, a model-ish uh, data object, and it assigns it to the request that user. Uh, so you probably need to keep that. Um, but a really great example on why you might need to replace the middleware would be single sign-on, which we'll talk in a bit. A really bad example, one that's straightforward, is say you just want random. You, you, want a, you want a shot at being any user at any time, depending on what you do. Give me a random user, sign in. This will work, this will, it, it will act as if you were whatever random user you have to pull out. Hopefully you get a super admin a couple times in a row, you can start doing some really bad stuff. Oops. Um, so single sign-on. Um, this is actually my most familiar case. I've implemented this before, and it replaces, it touches everything. It's really complicated code, and the go through it all kind of goes outside of the scope of this project. But it's a really good example if this is something you need. You can do this using only what Django provides you by extending it out and replacing all of the built-in pieces. Um, if this is something you're interested in and want to uh, hear my thoughts on it, just please find me at the end of this one. But so in concept, you don't really have to do much differently from what you've shown. It's just your, your, you know, your replacement um, your replacement author authorized backend is going to be a lot bigger for single sign-on. Your custom your custom user is going to be a lot bigger, but it's the same pieces as you've shown us, just like more above them and more complication to those pieces. Yeah. Exactly, and that's why I showed the simple, bad, horribly insecure examples as I did. Is they they get to the nitty gritty. The rest is just filler code. I think the only exception with single sign-on is you do need, do need to know a little bit more about the session portion of things, which while separate from off, it's pretty strictly linked. Um, so you need to know a little bit more about that. But other than that, it's the thing, same thing. All right, so one thing you may have noticed in that last section is when, as we're, as Jacob was you know, going through the code here, um, notice that uh, his just user here um, still subclasses from Django Contrib auth model. So we're still using a Django model to store our model. Um, or to store our user. So what, what would happen if we wanted to just replace, um, actually replace the whole model, right? You know, I, I just showed you a few earlier enough that did this, and it seems, it seems pretty easy, um, and it is pretty easy. You just set databases to an empty list, and now Django has no more model owner. Um, <laughs> thank you. I don't think that's it. No, I'm pretty sure that's all it takes. We have more slides. Oh, but that's right. So this is the thing, in one sense, replacing the model layer is really easy, right? Yes, set databases to an empty dictionary and Django will not try to talk to a database. Just don't use it. If you don't want the models, just don't use it. But, so let's talk about the just don't use it first and then I'll come back to the button. <clears throat> so this is the view code that I showed before. Um, and again, like yes, very easy. If I want to use Redis instead of Django's model layer, just use Redis instead of Django's model. I mean, it's, very, it's, it's kind of so easy that you don't need much of a technique. There, but there's a few things to point out here. Um, you should feel mildly uncomfortable about this line of code connecting to the database in the views file. Does that make you squint a little bit? It, it should. It's, it's, it's weird. Like, why are we, you know, we don't have our database connection when we're using a, a, a Django's model layer. We're not connecting to the database in the views file. So why are we connecting to Redis here? And, you know, we have this, uh, we have, you know, db.get, we're using a very, we're using a Redis-specific call rather than any sort of abstraction layer. And the thing is that um, uh, frameworks are like ogres. Um, they, they, they smell, they, they have layers and they smell really bad. Wait, no. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> see, all, all the people with kids are laughing. Um, so, so, frameworks have abstraction layers for a reason. Like, you may not want to be using Django's model layer, but the concept of a model layer, as opposed to a view layer, as opposed to a renderer, like a template, that's an important abstraction, that's an important concept. And the coupling of models, this is a small M model, just a conceptual, be your data model, into your view code is an anti-pattern. It makes it very hard to extend. If you change your data format, it makes it difficult to, to change. 
This can actually be even more important when you're using non-relational data stores because in a relational data store, you're given, you're given the data model. It's relational. But in a, in a non-relational store, in a system like Redis, you have to actually kind of decide how you're going to model and how you're going to store your data and what sort of, sorts of data structures you use. And, um, and, and those are, um, there's, there, the answers are not always obvious. And, and if you decide you need to make a change, it can be, um, you can involve a lot of sort of key rewriting. And so it's pretty important to, um, to continue to enforce this separation of concerns, to continue to abstract your, your model layer whether or not you actually have, you know, models. Um, I was showing some code that I had written before, and I had a bunch of Redis code in a models.py, and someone asked me, like, why is, why is that here? Is it models.py for Django models? I'm like, no, models, like, models are where you put your models. What else would you call that? Would you call that file? The, the abstraction is the important part, not what's in that file. I'd recommend, if there's an existing encapsulation layer for the, the data store that you want to use, SQL Alchemy, Mongo Engine, etc. I'd recommend you use that. Um, otherwise, uh, otherwise, what I've heard called popos, I hate that name. Um, plain old Python object, right? Just write a Python class. It doesn't need to subclass from anything, just subclass from object, and encapsulate your data logic into that class. And this lets you do a very familiar separation of concern step where um, you have a models.py that has some model object, and now in my views, I get a very nice you know, person dot get living view. And it's a very easy abstraction. If I want to change how I'm storing my data, the shape of my data, it's very easy to do, right? So this is the it's easy part. Um, and, and it really is. If, if all you want to do is use, use Django as a routing layer and maybe you know, and maybe templates or maybe Django REST framework, but you want all your data to be in Redis or React or et cetera, very, very easy to do. And here's the part where it, the, the train runs off the rails. So let's say you want to use forms with this, this person object that you've just written. Easy, just use model form, right? No, not at all. Um, unfortunately, uh, once you replace Django's models with your own models, lots of things stop particular model form and auth don't work very well without models. In fact, Jacob's original idea for the auth section was to not use models at all, and that turned out to be painful. Yeah. Um, and if you don't get model forms and auth, what depends on model forms and auth? Yeah. Yeah. So usually when people talk about, re about replacing the model layer, what they really mean is I want to use a different data store, but I want to keep the end. And unfortunately, that's not a trade-off that Django, that's a trade-off that Django forces you to take right now. If you want to use a different data store, you give up the app. You give up a lot of third-party apps. You can't use, you can't use Django tagging with Redis because the data stores are incompatible. You can sort of use Haystack if you're willing to write some adaptive code. You can sort of use TastyPy if you're willing to write some adaptive code. REST framework works pretty well, but there's a lot of sort of this evaluation of third-party of third-party tools. Um, and it's also very hard to integrate into the core pieces of Django, like sessions and auth, um, et cetera. It can be done. Um, take a look at this tool, Mango, which is uh, combines Mongo and Django. Get it? Mongo, Django, Mango. Um, it uses, and it replaces <laughs> sessions, and it replaces, um, uh, it gives auth backends, and it gives a, a sort of Mongo engine um, uh, Mongo form, which is similar to a model form. Um, so it can be done, right? This is a thing that you can do. Um, but it's in depth. It's a fairly large amount of work. The odds of actually getting something as complex as the admin to work with, with a different data store, probably uh, probably not worth your time to even try. It's gonna, it, you will get deep in the weeds very, very quickly. So you can sort of remove model layers easily, but you have to deal with a lot of consequences when you do so. So overall, let's take a look at how we did it. Um, we sort of went through and gave ourselves, gave Django like a grade and how well it, it gets out of your way when you don't, when you don't want that. So Jacob, you said templates got Templates, was, a. templates was an easy, it's an A. Uh, it's very decoupled. Um, no reason to make any changes to it. And then how about auth? 
uh, when you are extending off, it's really easy. All, com all the components are broken down into really tiny pieces that are easy to either um, uh, extract out or just straight up replace. When you're replacing everything, especially if you're trying to not use models at all, it, it's, it's hard. Replacing, I would say, is a B, assuming you keep the model. If you replace the model, it's closer to a D. So we'll have to out, call it a C. Um, and as for views, I, I said a B when it comes to views. Like, it's very easy to get rid of and not use, and not do views the way Django does views, but the URL layer is really baked into the center of how Django works. You have very little control over it. And so if you want to break that contract, you're, you're probably not gonna, gonna get there. So you can still do everything you want to do, but it doesn't quite get all the way to like, yep, yeah, just totally, just totally replace it. Um, and models is a really interesting course. It's a really interesting case. Like, yes, it's very easy. Uh, you get you get the A, but the consequences are pretty bad. You know, you have to. It, it's very easy to do, but you have to give up an arm to to make it happen. Um, and so you have to decide whether that trade off is, is is worth it for you. Whether you're willing to not deal with the uh, not deal with the, the, the or not use the parts of Django uh, that you, you know, want to use. So let's look at what we didn't talk about. What's left, assuming we wrote an app that replaces everything we already uh, replaced, as mentioned. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. At the core of everything, running through all of these pieces of art is the settings model that ties everything together. Um, and unfortunately, getting rid of that, um, not not an easy thing. Even you know the, the Django core developers have been talking about getting rid of settings probably as long as there have been settings. And we're at one seven now, and no no real plans to move to, to do to do anything about it other than continue to uh, complain about it. Then we have routing, which is just taking the URL and making sure we find the right view with the right variables. Again, really baked in, um, also really tied to the, re the request response middleware sort of cycle. Um, the sort of request response cycle is, is probably relatively easy to, to mess around with now that, um, now that Django exposes a more sort of standard WSGI application, you could probably do some interesting tricks with intercept with providing custom whiskey apps and intercepting the request response cycle and using WSGI middleware instead of Django middleware. Um, we wanted to do a section on that in this talk but didn't have time. That's a reasonably easy thing to do. I've seen people using like Beaker instead of Django sessions for example and it's reasonably easy to do. Um, so there's some you have some control there. And then there's forms, but why would you want to replace forms? Forms are awesome. <laughs> so just keep using those. Even if you replace everything else, keep using those. <laughs> so in a way, like, you know, there's not that much left at this point, right? If you take out templates and models and views and um, and, and, and auth, you, you end up left with what basically looks like a, a WSGI routing stack. And so in theory, you could kind of drop the rest of that until you're left with pure WSGI. And uh, now you have something to work on in the sprints. That's not a bug of this talk, it's a feature. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> and a couple of quick shameless plugs. Um, if you need a job, RevSys is hiring. If you need people to do work for you, RevSys is available. <laughs> Sorry, Heroku is hiring. <laughs> 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 Too many hats. Frank's having a heart attack right now. <laughs> Repsis is not hiring. I don't know, talk to Frank. <laughs> Heroku most definitely is. And Repsis is also available to do work for you. Thank you, Jacob. We have time for a few quick questions. Russ has a question. <laughs> You say it's very easy to replace templates with Jinja, uh, but it still involves some third-party apps um, like uh, Jingo or Django Coffin. And I know there's some code in third-party apps that have a debug toolbar to explicitly support these. And so, I think we're not quite there yet uh, in terms of API. And so, we probably have one of two things to do: uh, either improve the API so we can really switch it easily, or just switch to Jinja too. And so, where are we on this from now? <laughs> So before I'll let you think about that real quick, it should be noted that while that's all true, you get, 
it's not the end of the world if you're 90% using Jinja 2, and some of the third-party apps are still using the Jinja 2 one uh, language. That's not like, it's not like once you switch, you can't never touch the Jinja 2 one uh, engine again. Tool, toolbar is a bit of a special case because it needs to inject itself into your pages, so it needs to know what template engine you're using. So toolbar is a bit of a, a special case. For the most part, third-party apps go into side by side. Um, yeah, you know what? I'm totally not going to answer that, that bigger question here on stage. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to write a check that uh, I can't cash. Um, yeah. So settings. Um, <laughs> Bye. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> for the for the benefit of the audience, I mean, you, you, just, you did you did come up with a problem, and internally we know why it's a problem. I think what, if you give the 10 cent version of why it is such a big drop, other than it's the way it is and changing it, it's hard. Why, why, is, why is it there and why did we do it that way? And why is it so hard for it to get real and do something else? Right, so the, I'll start with the why. I'll start with the why it's bad. You run into problems with settings as soon as you try to do anything resembling multi-tenancy, right? As soon as you try to be running, um, you know, try, try to write something like Basecamp that has multiple users and multiple databases and sort of, you know, dispatching based on login information. And you will quickly run into a situation where you, you need a different template search path for this particular request and have it when the template search path is a physical setting. Um, the problem is that, temp that settings aren't this like, super global. They're instantiated once with the entire Django, life of the Django server, and, and it's super unclear. Some of them can be changed at runtime. Some of them can be changed as long as you do some magic behind the scenes. Some of them, if you change them, everything will blow up in your face. And it's entirely unclear which, which it is and how to do it safely and those sorts of things. Um, they exist because they make simple sites simple, right? It's a classic case of like, the, make the easy thing easy. The problem is that it makes the easy thing easy and it makes the hard thing impossible. And that's where the really big problem is. So the reason they haven't, the reason we haven't figured out any way of of punting them to the curve is because we can't figure out anything that continues to be easy, right? All the solutions we've come up with make easy, easy things like intermediate and make hard things possible. And we want to keep easy things easy, so it's a, it's a really hard nut to crack. Like keeping the easy, sim simple story on getting started, but then um, making sure that you can still do the really complex, complicated stuff. For and just a quick plug as well. The bit we're talking about replacing the model layer and how people do this to integrate with other, uh, other data stores and whatnot. Hopefully, end of this summer of code will be addressed. Uh, uh, the summer of code project I'm mentoring this year is actually addressing that specific issue, documenting the layers, and the proof of concept is essentially going to be accessing your email inbox through, through Django's ad uh, to prove that you can build other data models on the client. So uh, watch this space, and hopefully, Django 1.8 or 1.9 will make it very clear. So, fingers crossed. <laughs>